Well, good evening. Welcome to Tuesday Night Bible Study. I'm so glad to be with you tonight. We're going to um, open in prayer, and then we're going to jump in uh, to what we have for Bible study tonight, uh, talking about equipping the saints part two. Uh, Father, thank you that the entrance of your word brings light and it brings understanding. Father, I ask that as um, I speak forth uh, what you have given me uh, for the people, Lord, I ask that you would make my tongue as the pen of a ready writer, Father. Lord, I ask that you would uh, come be with us. Holy Spirit, we say welcome here uh, to be with us, uh, to illuminate, to be our teacher, um, our guide, Father. I thank you for the Holy Spirit and that this is part of his function. So, Lord, as we dive into your word tonight, let it take root in our heart. Let it not just be logos, which is understanding, but let it be rhema, which is the spoken word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, if you were here with me uh, last week, you know, we were in Ephesians chapter four and we read uh, the first part of Ephesians chapter four and we talked about the five fold ministry gifts that Jesus gave as gifts to the body of Christ to equip the saints um, in fact, I, I, I want to go ahead and reread just that piece, um, starting in verse 11 of Ephesians 4. It says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So. We talked last week when we were together about this portion of scripture and how we are not just saved from something. We don't come to Jesus just for fire insurance. We come to Jesus understanding that he is our savior and we are made righteous and put back into the family of God When we accept him as Lord of our life and that he gave us gifts in the fivefold ministry gifts, he gave us gifts to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, which means that if you are a believer in Christ, you signed up to be in the ministry. Congratulations. And so tonight we are going to pick up in Ephesians chapter four, and we are going to start in verse 17. And the, the next uh, portion of scripture we're going to talk about, Paul is talking about the new man and what we're to take off and what we are to have put on in our newness. Again, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is passed away, and behold, the new has come. And so we are, we are walking through the book of Ephesians, and we are taking in these nuggets, these in him realities. And Paul is about to drop some truth on the church at Ephesus and on the church that is here and now about what that looks like. And so we're going um, to verse 17 is where we're going to pick up. And it says this, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that you put 
concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul just dropped a whole bunch of truth. In other words, he's telling us that once we have heard the gospel, the good news of God's plan of salvation through the sending of his son. Once we have heard it and received it, we're to put off the stinking thinking. We're to put off the stinking actions that we lived in before we heard the truth and accepted him. And in doing so, we have to take off our old conduct, the way that we used to do things. If you were a liar before coming to Christ, in Christ, you are no longer a liar. And therefore, your conduct should look different. What comes out of your mouth should be truth. If you were a thief before you came to Christ, Once you are in Christ, you steal no more. You don't take things that don't belong to you. In other words, he's saying you have to put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Righteousness is the understanding that we have been made right Put back into right standing with God the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus walked earth as a man and did not sin. He lived a holy and blameless life. So if Jesus walked that way, once we're in him, We're walking in that reality that he has created us new. We are a new creation. He has created us new. And therefore, we too walk in holiness just like Jesus. Moving forward into verse 25, it says, Therefore, putting away lying... Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Now the understand under. Stood subject of these verses is you. You put away lying. You be angry and don't sin. You don't give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another tender hearted forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you now remember Paul didn't write in chapter and verse 
chapter and verse is there for our ease of use of the Bible to find scripture when we're looking for something specific. But he didn't write in chapter and verse. He wrote a letter. And so in this letter, he is telling us to put away the things that we formerly did before BC, before Christ, our BC days, our before Christ days. And that we are to have a difference in conduct in how we deal with each other and how we deal with the unbeliever. You know, it floors me when people get so upset at a non-believer acting like a non-believer. Why do we get offended at that? They are doing what they know their nature to be. Are they not? In the same way, we should be known by our new nature and how we interact with each other. You know, I'm a firm believer that believers should be the happiest people walking planet Earth. Not because happy equals joy, but because the joy of the Lord that is down on the inside of us as a believer, that joy allows us to express happiness and joy. And it's not contingent upon the circumstance that we're walking around in. How many of y'all know we live in a broken world and therefore in this broken world, we are going to have trouble. Jesus told his disciples all the way back in John 15. In this world, you will have trouble. The Bible says that he causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. In other words, life is going to happen. Circumstances are going to happen. But how we respond should be indicative of the fact that we know who is on the inside of us. Like, he lives in me. The spirit of the living God lives in me. And therefore, it should be evident in my interaction with others, whether they're a believer or a non-believer. If they're a non-believer, I pray it's a testament to them that they're like, what is so different about her? How come she didn't get upset about that? And he says specifically to the church at Ephesus that we're not to allow any corrupt speech to come out of our mouth. In other words, we're not to talk like the unbeliever. We're not to speak like the unbeliever. But instead, what should come out of our mouth is what is good for necessary edification, that it imparts grace to the hearer. And then he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now think about this. Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus. And he is having to remind them what not to do and what they should be looking like. And I love this in verse 32. He just says, be kind to one another, tender hearted forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. It's this constant pointing back to we're to look like him. We're to be conformed and grow up into the head, which is Christ. 
And if y'all remember in uh, last week, we talked about how we are one body with many parts, many functions, and we can't look at another brother or sister in the church and say we don't need them and their gift and their talent. Oh, if we would only get the revelation. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving. And because Paul didn't write in chapter and verse, we're going to jump into chapter five, picking up in verse one. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Be imitators of God as dear children. If there's anybody listening to me that's a parent, you you had children at some point that were little bitty and they learned by watching you. They imitated what you did. They tried to say what you said. God's telling us through the Apostle Paul that we're to be imitators of him. Oh, that's beautiful. We're to be inner imitators of him and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, aren't y'all glad you're a whosoever? I know I am. Whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. We're called to walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us. Like Paul doesn't just say love. He says, and gave. You know, and the last four months, um, our family has been walking through a cer- certain set of circumstances and I keep saying this. This is like the mantra in my house and in my when I in my conversation with my parents and love looks like something. The love of God looks like something. And in our circumstance where we are dealing with an unbelieving family member. The love of God has to look like something. It can't just be, I tell the person I love them. Because how many of y'all know, talk is cheap. There's a whole bunch of people walking around in this day and age that say things that they don't ever intend to do. But the love of God, which Paul tells us back in, in Romans, is supposed to be shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit is to compel us to do something, to have action to that. And so we're to walk in love, not love like man loves, not phileo love, not brotherly love, but agape, the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts. And therefore, there has to be action to that. It looks like something. So Paul reminds the Ephesians that the church at Ephesus, that they need to walk in love. And I believe God is reminding us we need to walk in love as Christ loved and gave himself. 
but fornication, jump into verse three, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Again, he's reminding them, you're a new creation in Christ. You're to be an imitator of God. And therefore, these things should not exist. Or be named as fitting among the saints, among the uh, among the believing. For this, you know. That no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Paul's saying here, we have choice to choose not to operate in the way that the world responds and the way that the world does things. We can choose to operate in our understanding of kingdom living. Christ came to bring the kingdom of God Here on the earth. And we are citizens of that kingdom. If we are believers in him. And the finished work of the cross. So in verse eight, he goes on to say, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Once we were darkness, we were disbelieving, we were unregenerated, we were not new creations, but now we are walking in the light and we need to live as those who know that they are called to be light. In Matthew and the Sermon of the, on the Mountain, in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells the people listening to him that you are the light of the world, a city on a hill. Well, a city on a hill is sh with light is shining for all to see. And here Paul reminds them that you are no longer darkness. You are children of the light. And therefore you need to walk in that reality. For the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Have you all ever walked into a thoroughly dark room? You can't see anything. But the moment you either turn the flashlight on in your on your phone or you flip the light switch on, the room ceases to be dark and is illuminated. That's what we're called to be. Do you know the difference between a thermostat and a thermometer? A thermometer tells you the temperature in the room. My dad, Pastor Charles, he is a man who loves his weather. Loves his weather. My mama and I think he's a little obsessed with the weather app on his phone. But that man loves to know what the temperature is. A thermometer 
tells you what the temperature is in the room. Do you know what a thermostat does? A thermostat sets the temperature in the room. Which one do you think we're called to be? Are we called to be thermometers or are we called to be thermostats? Well, based on everything we've just read just this evening, never mind all the weeks before, but just this evening, I'm here to tell you you're called to be a thermostat. You walk into rooms and atmospheres change because you bring the light of Christ with you. That's what you're called to do. This is Paul's admonition to uh, the church at Ephesus. You're not to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. In other words, don't play around with sin. But rather expose, <laughs> expose the unfruitful works by shining the light. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake, O you sleeper, arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. Without Christ, I can do nothing. But once I get a hold of the reality that he lives on the inside of me, I am recreated and new and called to be an imitator of my father who is God. I'm going to walk a little different than I did before. Because I'm walking out the identity of who he says that I am. Verse 15 says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is and do not be drunk with wine in which is dis dissipation, but be filled with the spirit speaking to one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So he just he just unpacked a whole bunch of things. I do not think that the Apostle Paul would have told the church at Ephesus not to be drunk with wine if that was not happening. And so he is reminding them that they're to be filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God who lives on the inside of us, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks. I truly believe thanksgiving is the currency of heaven. Because when we... Even in the midst of hard circumstances, gaze upon our Father, God, and we can say thank you and express gratitude for all that He has done. 
for sending his son, for loving us, his creation, enough that he wanted to put us back in the family. When we can do that without a motivation of it being transactional, we're thanking him to get something. But when we can genuinely express thankfulness and gratitude from our innermost being, I believe that's the currency of heaven. God looks over at his son, Jesus, and says, do you see my child? But not only are we to have thanks, give thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, but then we're to submit to one another in the fear of God. So I just have a couple of closing thoughts on on uh, tonight, and then we're gonna we're gonna stop here for for tonight. Um, I have a couple of uh, thoughts. Um, so if you flip over in your Bible real quick um, to the book of James, I love the book of James. I read the book of James often, and I allow it to read me because Lord knows I am. I am growing up into the head. I have not arrived. Um, I am on my journey going from glory to glory. But if you go to the book of James chapter one and starting in uh, verse one, James, a bond servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes, which are scattered about abroad greetings. So James tells you that he is writing to his Jewish brothers in the Lord. It says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So Paul tells us to give thanks always in all things to be submitted to one another in the fear of God. And James then tells us to count all joy when we face less than perfect things. Not because the less than perfect things are joyful or, um, are 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 fantastic but rather because the joy giver lives on the inside of us and because he lives on the inside of us we can have joy even in the midst of chaos dark times and tribulation we can have the joy that passes all understanding or the joy unspeakable, excuse me, and full of glory, and the peace that passes all understanding. And then we're to be submitted to one another in the fear of God. I just recently had the opportunity to have a talk with a a friend of mine, um, and we were talking about how God is really identifying who we are running with if we're to run with them in this season of life that we find ourselves. And um, I think that's happening across the body of Christ where the, the ones that are, are truly sold out living for the Lord are becoming defined, more defined. And the ones who are, just going through their religious motions are becoming apparent. But we're to be submitted to one another in the fear of God. What's that mean? 
Well, that means that if I call you my sister or my brother in Christ and I do life with you and I'm walking with you, I'm in community with you, you should have the ability to speak into my life. If you see me going the wrong way or making a bad decision or stepping where I shouldn't be stepping. And on the other side of that, I, if I'm doing life with you, if I am um, in community with you, in fellowship with you in Christ, should have that same ability to speak into your life, to impart into your life, to give correction when necessary in love, Mind you, back back here at the beginning of chapter five, he talks about you got to be walking in love. You're to speak the truth in love. It's not a bad word to have accountability. And in this day and age that we live, we who call ourselves Christ followers, disciples of him, we need to be willing to, to submit ourselves to another, to be held accountable, to do what we say we're going to do, to behave the way that we say we're going to behave, to live our life as a testimony of what we say we believe in accountability. So that's where we're going to leave it today. Uh, tonight because where we're going to go next week talks about Christ and his bride, which is the church. I love Paul's imagery. Uh, the uh, way he words this to the church at Ephesus. And we're going to unpack that the next time we're together. And talk about these relationships and what they look like. So let's go ahead and uh, we're going to close in a word of prayer and just ask the Lord to seal his word upon our heart. Father, we thank you that we get to, we don't have to, but we get to read your word. And your word is the truth that sets us free and keeps us free. Father, I ask that you would seal upon our hearts these in Christ realities. Lord, I ask that you would search us. And if there be anything in us that does not look like you, Father, we give permission for the master gardener to prune us, to strip it away from us so that we can be conformed to the image of you, Papa. Thank you for your word. Seal it upon our hearts. May we not just be hearers of the word, but may we be doers of the word. Otherwise, we're just deceived. In Jesus' name, amen.